Hey church, welcome to today's Oceanside at Home stream. stream. Hope that you're doing well with your family. Hope that you are comfortable at home. I can't wait to see you in person. I promise we're getting closer and closer and closer and closer and closer and closer. Please, please believe me. As a matter of fact, this week, look out for some updates uh, with some footage and some, uh, uh, some visuals about the building progress and really what the next step is as we go into launching back and opening back up. So stay tuned for that. But hey, today, if you're tuning in for the first time, welcome to Oceanside Church. We are so honored and privileged to have you being part of our stream today. As a matter of fact, here on the screen, you're gonna find a QR code that you can scan with your phone. And it's gonna take you to this thing we call the Connect Card. Fill out some basic information. And tomorrow, our team is gonna reach out to you and help you learn more about our church if you so choose. If not, you can disregard, you can hit unsubscribe. But I just believe that God has so much in store for you and our church exists to help you move forward in all the things that God has for you. We exist to help you know God more, discover the freedom that He has for you, for you to discover what your purpose is and that ultimately you can make a difference in our city, in our world, and above all else in your personal sphere of life. We want you to change your world with all the things that God has in store for you. And today's a special Sunday. We have none other than Dennis Esteban, who's over, over, overseeing all of our next steps preaching. But before we get to that, I think we ought to praise our God a little bit more. Why don't you turn up the volume of, of your TV or your smartphone and just let praise fill your heart, let praise fill your house, because I believe that God inhabits the praises of His people. And I just know that I know that where God's presence is, there is freedom. Where God's presence is, there's supernatural hope. And I pray that today, by the end of this stream, you're going to leave better than how you tuned in. I love you. I'll be back in a little bit. Let's worship together. Come on.
amen, amen, amen. I hope that your house is again filled with his praises. Can I pray for you for a sec? I don't know what you're dealing with today. I don't know what the hardships in your heart is, but we're a praying church. We believe that when we come together and we lift up the name of Jesus and we cast our cares upon him, the Bible actually instructs us and shows us that he cares. As a matter of fact, that his mighty hand is able to provide, protect, and guide. So Father, we come before you today, Lord, and we magnify your glorious name. We thank you, Jesus, that in you we find all that we need. Lord, we know that regardless of our need, we need you, Jesus. So right now, we pray that you would step into every circumstance. God, every need right now represented uh, uh, through 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 our church, Lord, I pray that you would step in and do what only you can do, that you would provide, you would protect, you would direct, and God, you would heal. I pray, Holy Spirit, right now for everybody who is dealing, Lord, with uh, 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 uncertainty in their future. I pray, Lord, that although they may not know what the future holds, I pray that right now, Lord, they will find comfort and security in knowing, Lord, that you are the God that holds their future in the palm of your hand. God, I pray that you'd bring peace to the weary heart, that you'd give strength to every body, to every soul, to every emotional turmoil. I pray, God, for the marriages of our church, may it be strengthened. And God, we pray that as we reopen our doors, Lord, that you would blow our minds away, that you would do exceedingly, abundantly more than we can ask, think, or imagine, according to your power at work in us and through us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Oh, hey, you're getting ready to hear the word of God. But I just wanna take a moment, and again, if you're tuning in for the first time, fill out that connect card. We want to do life with you. But also church, thank you for that during this season of really these three months, can you believe it's been three months of not gathering? You've remained so committed to our church. You've been remain, you've remained so committed to the vision and mission of Oceanside Church. I pray that today um, that God's hand will be over the stream, that you would be encouraged to continue to do all that God has called you to do and live on mission and live in community. And I also want to take a moment and thank you for your generosity. Thank you that you still have remained faithful with your tithes and with your offering. Maybe you're tuning in today and you've yet to take the next step in your giving. The Bible says in Malachi 3.10, a famous passage of scripture that says, bring all of your tithe to the storehouse that there may be food in my house. You see the word tithe, it's a tenth of everything. And what's interesting about Jesus's or, or God's teaching on the tithe Three little things I want you to get. God's, com- it's not a suggestion, it's a command from God. But also, God's commands, they are not burdens, they are blessings to cease. And three, your obedience to his command, it opens up a door of blessing that will blow your mind. Test God on this, he says, and watch as you give or return your tenth, your tithe, watch as he does more with your 90 in his hands than a hundred in your hands. I pray that you're blessed financially today as you remain faithful to the cause and the mission of Jesus, amen? Well, hey, nevertheless, today, Dennis Estimon has a word on his heart. So I encourage you to get a Bible, get a notebook, and let's lean into the word of God and see what he has in store for us. I love you so much, church. I'll see you in person very soon. God bless you. Happy Sunday, Oceanside Church. Thank you for tuning on this morning or evening, wherever you find yourself watching this. My name is Dennis, and I have both the honor and the privilege to serve here on team at Oceanside Church. And again, I want to thank you for tuning in. You didn't necessarily have to be here, but yet you chose to be here. And today, really, I want to encourage you from Mark chapter 2. And Mark chapter 2 is a familiar passage for most of us. You probably heard myself preach about it. You probably heard Pastor Bennett preach about it. But Mark chapter 2, we're on the topic of community. And maybe you didn't know, this season, this past week actually, we relaunch OC groups. OC groups is actually one of the most, is one of the perfect opportunities for you to get in a group, to get in community. And what you find at OC groups is you find family. You find friendships, you find freedom. And I want to encourage you before this message even starts, before we go through this text, get in an OC group. Because in an OC group, what you'll find is you'll find transformation. You'll find some people who actually care about you. You'll find some people that are people that are actually concerned for you. 
And you'll have some people that are willing to come alongside you and walk through life with you. So if you're a man, there's an OC men's group. Women, there's OC women's group. Um, you know, this past week we had, you know, OC young adults group. And no matter what season you find yourself in, there is a group for you. So I encourage you, get in a group. But today, we're going to be in Mark chapter 2, and we're going to be in Mark chapter 2, verse 1. Again, this is a familiar passage. This is, the, this is a passage that you probably heard several times from me or Pastor Bennett. But it's in these familiar passages where we have to still allow God to speak something to us. Because there's so much in this text that I believe that if you receive it today, can impact your life for good. So, Mark chapter 2, verse 1, and it reads like this. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no more room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. And some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening to the roof above Jesus by digging through it. And then they lowered the mat that the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, come on, somebody say their faith. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Verse six, now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. So he got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone. And they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this before. We have never seen anything like this before. Today, I want to preach to you from a simple topic or something that I titled, Meet Me at My Mat. Meet me at my mat. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for the opportunity today to explore your word. Lord, we know that your, your word is powerful. We know that your word is sharper than any double-edged sword. And we know that your word can penetrate. We, we know that your word can do something within us that nothing else can do. So, Lord, Lord, we ask you today to just make your word come alive within us. Lord, give us the ears to understand some of the things that we're going to hear today. And, Lord, give us the faith and the courage to actually put into practice some of the things that we hear today. Lord, we thank you for all that we're doing. Lord, we're praying for groups in this moment. We're praying for anybody that may be scared to join a group or somebody that may May, may not be open to essentially getting in, in an environment where they don't really know anybody. I'm praying for that person today. I'm praying that as we, as we look at your word, that they'll get a revelation of who you are and all that you can do. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen, amen, amen. So as I was preparing for this message, I remember a story from, you know, when I was 16. It was about, you know, 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. And some of my friends came and picked me up to, you know, take me to a party. And, you know, we were young and dumb kids. But I remember that night we, you know, my friend picked me up from my house. Again, I wasn't even supposed to be leaving my house at that time. But I can just remember <laughs> them picking me up. And, you know, we all get in the car. It's about five, six of us dudes in, in the one car and a little Honda Civic. And, you know, we're driving around looking for these parties that we probably wouldn't even be able to get in anyway. And I remember, you know, we got to a first party and as soon as we show up to this place the cops were there so we're like all right we got to get out of here so 
we go and we drive somewhere else in same situation. By the time we get out of the car and we walk inside and we see people and we recognize people that we know, the again, the, the, the police show up. Same thing again and we, we do the same thing. We're, we're, we're driving around for hours trying to find what the next move is and, and ne the next place we basically show up to, it's the same thing again. So we spent all night essentially driving around. We spent all night looking for something to do. We, we spent all night looking to have fun. So by this time now, it's about 12 o'clock at night and we literally came out, put our cologne on, we we're, you know, dressed up as best as we thought we looked. And we came out and really, we didn't get the thing that we were looking for. You know, we were looking to go to a party. Some people, you know, some of my friends were looking for girls, but that we came out, we drove around all night long and we found nothing. So now it's about 12.30, 1 o'clock in the morning, and, you know, I'm like, hey, take me home. They're like, no, you don't need to go home yet. You know, let, let's drive around for a little bit. So essentially, we have now two cars full of people um, that we met along in different places, and now we're in these two cars, and we're essentially, we're driving down the streets to my friends. You know, they're racing. It's a little Honda Civic versus a Mustang, and, you know, and everybody's in the car, and they're having the time of their life, and... We're going essentially 75 on a 30, 35, 40, you know, 40 miles per hour street. And somehow, some way, my two friends, they end up crashing into each other. You know, now we're in the middle of the road. We're in the middle of the street. And both cars are basically destroyed and can barely move. And now here I am, I'm sitting and I'm in this car. I'm like, what the heck am I doing here? So we, we were driving, we, you know, we, we were driving around all night just for us to end up in crash into each other. And as I'm sitting there in the car, and we're, well, now we're outside of the car, I'm thinking to myself, the only thing that was ringing in my ear is something that my mom always said, that nothing good happens after 12. Nothing good happens after 12. So now me, I'm 16, I'm 15, 16 at the time, and I'm like, oh no, we're gonna have to call the police. We're gonna have to, they're gonna take me home. And I'd rather deal with the police than deal with my mom. Like, what am I gonna do? And at that moment, I, I realized we spent all night long driving around with no destination in mind. And what happened is we drove, we drove all night just to end up and crash into each other. And now both, now all of us are outside the vehicle figuring out what am I going to do next? So now I'm here and I'm outside this car and I'm like, oh God, what am I gonna do? Well, I decide I sure am not gonna stay here and wait for the cops to take me home. So immediately I say, hey, pop the trunk, let me grab my stuff. So I grab my backpack and I just start walking home. This is like 1 a.m. in the morning, little black at night. I'm, I'm literally just walking home by myself. You know the old saying, ride till the wheels fall off? Well, that's what I did. The wheels fell off, so I cleared it. I left. And, you know, my, my house is about 2.5 miles away. So, But I knew that I was not going to stay where they were going to stay. So I essentially I took my bags and I went home. And... Really, what, what, what I think this story is, the reason why I told you this story is I think that this, this story is a picture of a lot of our relationships, whether it's our friendship relationships or if it's our romantic relationships. I believe a lot of us, we get into these relationships with people and we get into these relationships with people and we get in the car. If, the, if your relationship is a vehicle, you have to ask yourself, where are you headed? So we get into these relationships with people, but we get into these relationships not having an idea or not having a destination in mind. I've heard one person say that the two greatest answers you can ever answer in life or the two greatest questions you can ever answer in life is one, where am I going? And two, who will go with me? And I've also heard it said that if you get these two questions, in the wrong order, then you're in trouble. And so I think a lot of our relationships look like that. In, in the sense, when we get into the vehicle that's called a relationship, we get into the vehicle not having an idea or not having a destination of where we're headed. And essentially what we do is we ride till the wheels fall off. 
we get into the relationship or we stay a part of that community or that friend group until something goes wrong. And essentially we're riding, we're, we're going, we're having a good time, but we're actually not going anywhere. And at some point, something's going to happen. At some point, the tires are going to come off. At some point, you're going to have to stop for gas. And you're going to have to ask yourself the question, where is this headed? Where is this relationship going? And if, you, if you're anything like me, I realize at that moment, what am I doing here? I don't belong here. I don't belong with this group of people. So I took my bags <laughs> and I grabbed it and I went home. So that's a picture of our relationships. So now when you look at your relationships, when you look at your community, you have to ask yourself, the relationships that you're in, where are they headed? Where is that vehicle going? Are you just, are you, are, are you, are you moving towards your direction or are you having a good time going nowhere? And I think it's important that we answer or we talk about relationships and community. Because the, the first thing that we see in the Bible wasn't a sin problem. It was actually a solitude problem. You see, in Genesis, what we see is that God tells Adam that it's actually not good for man to be alone. So in the perfect world that God created, his intention was for us to have a relationship, a perfect relationship with one himself, but two have relationships with other people. So we were supposed to have a vertical relationship in a perfect horizontal relationship, a relationship with God and a relationship with people. But what we find out is after the fall of man in the garden, we see that now what was supposed to be perfect is now broken. What was supposed to be spotless is now stained. And now to this day, both you and I, because of the fall of man, our relationships aren't perfect. The situations we find ourselves aren't spotless, but yet there is still hope for you and I to be in relationships and to be a part of community that actually push us forward to Jesus and not pull us back. And that's exactly where we find ourselves in Mark chapter 2 today. In Mark chapter 2, we're told that Jesus is in Capernaum. And, it and what many, what many, you know, to put the text into context, what many scholars believe, many scholars actually believe that this is the home of Peter. So Capernaum was a city, it was a big city, so a lot of the people that grew up in Capernaum would have known each other. So we know that Jesus was probably in the house of Peter, and now this house is crowded. And in, in the text, it says that Jesus was preaching to them. But in that Greek word, it doesn't actually mean preaching in the formal sense, but it actually means that Jesus was really having a conversation with them. But the house was packed, the kitchen was full, you could barely even get, you could barely even get in. And, and, and here's a perfect picture, wherever God is, wherever Jesus is, the house should be packed. Wherever Jesus is, people should be coming. People should be flooding and, and saying, hey, if Jesus is here, I, I, I want to be there too. So what we find is Jesus is not preaching a sermon like he would in the synagogue, but Jesus was actually having a conversation. So Mark chapter 2, what we see is what can happen in a small group. Mark chapter 2 is actually what we can see what can happen in an OC group. And, and this group, the people that gathered, was not small by, by any chance. It was, it was a very large group of people. But this story actually illustrates to us what can happen when Jesus is in the house. Is Jesus in your house today? Is Jesus in your room today? Is Jesus with you today? But today I really want to look at a few key figures. And in, in this story we see that there's a crowd. We see that there is a community. We see that there is a, the paralytics. And then we see that there's Jesus. So it says in Mark chapter 2 that they gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached a word to them. 
some men, some men came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four of them. And since they could not get the man through the door because of the crowd, or since they could not get the man to Jesus because of the crowd. So now here's what you have to understand about the crowd. The, the crowd is actually made up of a mixed group of people. The crowd is made up of a group that some people came to find out who this Jesus guy is. Some people came to see like, hey, like, what is this thing really about? Some people came, as we can see, because they knew that, hey, if I can just get in the same room with Jesus, then I would be healed. Some people came because they knew that, hey, if I can just be in the same room with Jesus, then I, I will have a better mental state. Some people know that, hey, if I can just get in the same room with Jesus, then my finances might be better. Some people thought that, hey, if I can just get in the same room as Jesus, maybe my marriage can be fixed. So what we see is we see a group, we see a crowd that is coming because some of these people were probably hearing about all that the, all the miracles that was happening. So they say, hey, if we can just even get near the house, if we can just get close to Jesus, then something special, something miraculous can happen. And that's the same thing that we believe at Oceanside Church. When we gather on a Sunday, when we gather in groups, we believe that if we can just get people to Jesus, we believe that if we can just get people to experience the presence of God, we believe that if we can just get people to learn about Jesus, then some things will change, that their relationships will be restored, that their relationships will be transformed, that their relationships between brother and sister, the relationships between um, husband and wife, the relationships between mother and son, all of those relationships can be restored if we can actually get them into the presence of Jesus. Because when you get people into the presence of Jesus, what happens is healing takes place. Transformation happens and all, a whole bunch of things are restored. So that's what the crowd was there for. The crowd came to that room, came to that house because they were looking for something. So first we see the crowd. Second, we see the community. We see the community. We don't know if they were actually friends, but all we know was it was four men that were willing to carry this paralytic on a mat. And the funny thing I, I, the funny thing I find in that story is it actually took four men to carry him. So that actually indicates that he probably wasn't the lightest fella. That actually indicates that maybe he's, he's been on that mat for all his life. He, he's been a paralytic, so he hasn't been able to do any exercise. He's been on that mat. So it took four guys to carry him. And I don't know about you, but hey, if I took him to the door and I couldn't get in, I said, hey, all right, bro, we try to help you out. Now we got to go. But instead, we see that that, that that community, because they couldn't get in through the door, that they actually had to go up through the roof. And I just think, what would make them do that? What would make them go through the trouble of doing all of that for maybe somebody that's their friend or maybe somebody that they don't even know? I think it's because to some degree, that community, they have had an experience with Jesus. They have had an encounter with Jesus. They heard about how Jesus was healing people. So again, they said the same thing that we say, is, hey, we can just get this person to Jesus. If we can just get this person in the house, then maybe he'll be healed. Maybe his life will be transformed. Maybe his sins will be forgiven. So that's the crowd. There's, that's the community. And then we find a paralytic. Now the paralytic, we know that he's been paralyzed most, if not all, of his life. We know that the only thing that he probably has to himself is that mat. That mat is that thing that he's been... One, the thing that he's been lying on, and two, the mat was the thing that he's been relying on. And I don't know about you, but I believe that, actually I do know, I believe that you and I, we have a mat. We have a mat. We have something that we've been carrying, or something that's actually been carrying us most of our life. Something that no matter where we go, we still take it with us. And what happens is, that, that man, I, I believe the powerful thing about the paralytic is actually he allowed himself to be carried. Because here's the thing, you can get in a community, you can get in a small group, you can come to a Sunday service, but if you're actually not willing or allowing, allowing people to carry you, if you're not willing to open yourself up to people and be carried, 
then it, it might be possible that that healing that you're looking for, it's going to be very difficult to get it. So why did I give you those, those three different groups, the crowd, the community, and the paralytic? I gave that to you because depending on what season you're in, you'll always either be a part of the crowd, you'll always be a part of the community, or you'll always be a part, you'll always probably be the paralytic. So depending on the season you find yourself in, you will take one of these roles. And maybe today you, you find yourself as the paralytic. Maybe there is something within you that's paralyzed. Maybe your spiritual state is paralyzed. But now what happens is when you actually allow yourself, when you get in a community of people and you allow yourself to be carried, what happens is you actually can experience life change if you're in the right community. And look, real quick, let me tell you what is the difference between a good community and a godly community. See, a good community can give you good advice, but actually a godly community will actually carry you to Jesus. In the same way that these men know that, hey, if we can just carry him to Jesus, then, then his life will be transformed. So I think the powerful part about that story is when they, they, they get the man to the roof. And what happens is we know that back in that day, it's probably a clay roof. So they actually had to do some digging. And I can just imagine that as Jesus is having this conversation, as Jesus is addressing this crowd, dirt begins to fall. Dirt begins to fall through the ceiling. And if this is Peter's house, you know, Peter's probably mad. Like, what the heck is going on in my house? And what happens is we, we see that they begin to lower this man from the roof. And the first thing that Jesus says when they lower him, he says to them, he, 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 it, the scripture says that he saw their faith. Not the faith of the paralytic, but he saw the faith of the paralytic's community. So now my question is, are you allowing yourself to be a part of a group of people? Are you allowing yourself to open up and say, hey, I have a mat. I have something that I've been lying on. I have something that I've been relying on. I have something that, I, I, I have this thing within me that I just can't get over. So, so real quick, what is the mat? The mat is, the mat can be where you've been. The mat can be where you've been through. The, ba the mat can be that very thing that you've, you've been relying on. Maybe today you're listening and your mat has been alcohol. And, and every time something goes wrong within your life, that's the first thing you run to. Maybe you're listening today that your, your, your mat may be drugs. And that's the thing that carries you, no matter what emotional state that you're in, is that we all have a mat. We all have something that reminds us that we're not good enough. We all have something that carries us and that, that tells us that we, we may never be perfect. We, we, the mat for me, it could be, could be my place of my deepest anxiety. The mat can be the place of my deepest trouble. My, the mat can be the place of my deepest distress. But what happens is when you get yourself in a godly community, you know that you have some people that are not just going to meet you in the middle, but they're actually going to meet you at your mat and they will carry you to Jesus. And I think that the powerful part of this story in Mark chapter 2, when, you know, they, they, you know, it says since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it. And then they lowered the man that was lying on, that, that was lying there. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. So now this man, he came to the house because he wanted to be healed. But in fact, the first thing that Jesus says, Jesus doesn't say that you're healed, Jesus actually tells them, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, this is powerful because of that day and age, they believe that the sins or the, 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 sins, the sins that you, you had or the sins that you, you know, done are actually what, what creates, you know, the sickness of your life. So if you're sick, it's due to your sin. If you're paralyzed, it's due to your sin. So Jesus, knowing this, he goes and he says, son, your sins are forgiven. 
And the powerful thing about when you get into a community is when you get into the community, you, you at first, you might not get what you want, but first you get what you need. And the powerful thing about Jesus is Jesus not only knows what you want, but Jesus actually also, also knows that what you need. You might have you might have a physical problem, but every physical problem is actually attached to a spiritual problem. So Jesus not only says, hey, yes, I'm going to heal you. But first he says, your sins are forgiven. Because before God deals with the things out here, he really also want, he really wants to deal with the things within you. Before he, he fixes your um, vertical, you know, your, your vertical relationships. He also wants to fix your horizontal relationships. So he says to this man, son, your sins are forgiven. And now what happens is we see that part of the, in part of the crowd, we have the scribes, which could be the religious teachers or the, or the religious interpreters of this day. And now they begin to ask themselves and say, who can forgive sins but God alone? And they didn't know that they actually asked the perfect question. Because now Jesus, knowing what they're thinking, he says, which is easier? Is it easier to tell him that his sins are forgiven? Or is it easier to tell him to get up and walk? Now, why would Jesus say this? Jesus said this because he knew. Jesus said this because if he just told them that, if he just told the man that, hey, your sins are forgiven, well, that's great. You can't actually see anything. But by Jesus actually saying, get up, take your mat and walk home, and the man gets up, takes his mat and walks home, what happens is now his faith or the evidence of his faith actually proves who Jesus really is. Are you following me? So Jesus could have said, hey, your sins are forgiven. And okay, well, who can forgive sins? So Jesus says, hey, I'm not only going to forgive his sins, but the evidence of me forgiving his sins is also going to say, hey, get up and walk. And see, what I think is so powerful about this is Jesus says, he says, get up, take your mat and walk. And when Jesus says this, the powerful thing that I think a lot of times when this message is preached, we forget about the part where Jesus says, take your mat. When Jesus says, take your mat, I believe he's saying, take the thing that was once carrying you. And what we see here is that that which carried you in one season, after you have an experience in an encounter with Jesus, now you carry it. Maybe most of your life you, you have just been filled with shame. Maybe most of your life you just have been filled with guilt. Well, that which carried you, that which you relied on in one season, after you have an experience with God, after you have an experience with Jesus, that which carried you, you now carry it. That which carried you will now be a tool to actually carry out God's plan for your life. But all of that just goes to show the power of community. All of that goes to show what happens when you allow yourself to open up to people and when you allow a community of people to get around you and say, hey, we know you have a problem. And see, the thing I love about community, community won't just condone what you're going through, but community will actually confront it and know that they can carry you to Jesus. And see, that's the difference between relationship and religion. See, religion says, hey, you have to figure your way to God. But relationship says God has already made a way for you. See, religion says, hey, come to us. But relationship says, hey, we'll come to you. Religion says, hey, you have to be perfect. You have to have it together. But relationship says, we'll actually meet you at your mat. So I don't know what you walked in here with today. I don't know the things that you're carrying. I don't know the shame that you have within you. I don't know what, what are the things within you. Maybe it's the things that you've done, or maybe it was the thing that you didn't do. 
But all I know is you might be listening to this today and you have some areas in your life that you think or you think that's actually a barrier for you to get to Jesus. You have some things that you've done, maybe some past relationships that you have or things that you've done and you, you, you regret it. And you think that those things that you've done actually count you out. No, friend, it actually counts you in. You think that because you have a map, you think because you still have something that you're lying and relying on that you can't actually be a part of the community. Because if you actually open up, then maybe they won't like you. If, if, if you actually open up, then maybe people don't think you're Christian enough. But let me tell you, we want to be the type of church, and when you get in a group, we want to be the type of church that we're not just going to meet you in the middle. We're going to meet you at your mat. Again, we're going to meet you at the place of your deepest anxiety. We're going to meet you at the place of your deepest regret. We're going to meet you at the place of your deepest shame. And we're not just going to give you good advice, but we're going to carry you to the one. We're going to carry you to the person that's not just going to heal your body, but he's going to forgive your sins. We're going to carry you to the one that 2,000 years ago on a cross, stretched out with his hands wide, he, he died on a cross and he rose again. And what happened is when he died, he, he restored both the vertical relationships and the horizontal relationships. He restored both the relationship to himself and he restored the relationships with others. Now your mat, now your sin now, the things that you go through, now, the things that you've been, the places you've been, the things that you've done, those things don't have to be a barrier for you to get to Jesus. Now, if you can just allow yourself, if you can just be open, if you can actually just get yourself into a community, what happens is you'll experience and you'll meet people that says, hey, you don't, you don't have to have it together, but we'll meet you at your mat, and we'll bring you a man, to a man again that can restore every single part, you know, every single broken part of your life. So that's what we want to do. We want to meet you at your mat. But again, you know, you might have a physical problem today, but we know whether it's a physical problem, whether it's a financial problem, whether it's a relational problem, everything really starts with the spiritual issue. And again, that spiritual issue is because the fall of man, you and I, we're separate, we were separated from God, but because of what God did, we now can be reconciled into a relationship with him. And scripture tells us if we believe with our heart and we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, that we can be saved. So that's what happened. Now we're going to say a prayer. And we, when we say that prayer, I believe the mat is going to meet the master. I believe that all the things that has happened in your past, the things that you've been relying on, now you, not, you no longer, it no longer has to carry you you now can carry it. And after we say this prayer, after you decide to give your life to Christ, what's going to happen is now you're going to be able to go in rooms. You're going to be able to get in a group and you're going to be able to say, hey, this is the things that I've dealt with. This is the things that I, I've been through. These are the things that I've done that I'm not proud of. And you're going to encounter people that are going to, that, that are going to meet you at your mat. And that which carried you, now you carry it. And you, you, you live and you, you, you stand out as evidence to the power and the provision of God. So, hey, if you're going to make that decision to follow Jesus today, you can just simply repeat after me. Whether you're in a coffee shop or whether you're in your, you're in your living room, you can simply say this. Jesus, I believe that you came. I believe that you rose. And I believe that when you died... You died so that I may have life. So today, I place my past, I placed my present, and I place my future entirely in your hands. I'm yours, completely surrendered to you. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen, amen, amen. If you made that decision to follow Jesus, I can tell you all of heaven is rejoicing. All of heaven is rejoicing for you. And we at Oceanside Church, we're rejoicing with you. 
And now if you, if you haven't yet, we're going to encourage you, fill out that Connect card. And we're going we're gonna to continue to encourage you, get in an OC group. Because what you're going to find, again, is you're going to find some people that are going to meet you at your mat. You're going to find some people that whether you're in a season where you're the crowd or you're a part of the community or you're the paralytic, you're going to find some people that are going to be with you along the way. So, hey, get in an OC group. And we hope that you have an incredible week. See you next week.